Good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, this is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center and happy to welcome you all to our MPA webinar series. And today um, we're very fortunate to have Mia Kim who's with NOAA Fisheries with us and she's going to be talking about progress on establishing protected areas in the Southern Ocean and particularly about the Ross Sea MPA. And so this is uh, great timing for this webinar because we had planned it uh, several months ago but it turns out that we have some um, great news to report on in terms of the establishment of the Ross Sea MPA just as of last month. So um, I definitely encourage you to write in your questions in the webinar box and when uh, in the in the question box on the webinar interface and when um, we're done with the presentation Mia will take your questions. And I also want to thank our co-organizers Open Channels and EBM Tools Network. So. Thanks to everybody, and I will introduce Mia and then turn it over to her. So Mia um, is from the National Marine Fisheries Service Office of International Affairs and Seafood Inspection, and she has been there since 2008. And she is the NIMS policy lead for the U.S. delegation to the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, known as CAMELAR. And she also coordinates U.S. participation as an observer to the meetings under the Agreement on the Conservation of Albatrosses and Petrels and work on international seabird conservation. And she has worked on regulating U.S. vessels participating in high seas fisheries and in efforts to combat IUU fishing and has also previously worked with the NIMS Office of Protected Resources on Endangered Species. So welcome and thanks for being with us, Mia. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, and thank you to those who've joined the webinar for your interest in this topic. Um, as uh, Lauren mentioned, um, this ha is very timely. Uh, we didn't know as we were going into our last CAMELAR meeting what the outcomes would be, but fortunately um, the good news is that we have now um, a adopted a Rossi region marine protected area. So, oops, I will go into um, during this presentation, I'll give you some details on the Rossi Region MPA, uh, but I thought you might also be interested in hearing a bit about the MPA efforts generally um, that's been taking place in Camelar. Uh, you'll see, you've seen a couple of these really beautiful photographs on here. Um, the credit goes to uh, John Weller uh, for this, for his um, generosity and providing um, access to these images and. Uh, many of these um, news stories that you may have seen uh, include uh, photos uh, taken by John. So um, before I get jump into the Ross Sea MPA itself, I thought uh, I should give a little bit of a background on the Commission uh, for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, uh, or CAMELAR. CAMELAR operates under the convention um, that's titled on the slide before you, the objective of this convention is the conservation of Antarctic marine living resources and the term conservation includes rational use which um, does allow for commercial harvest uh, within the convention area. Uh, this is quite different from many other organizations that manage fisheries on the high seas um, in that the convention itself, itself speaks to conservation and uh, an ecosystem approach to management. As a matter of fact, the um, Convention includes certain conservation principles uh, that are to be followed when uh, we're looking at harvesting or um, associate ac associated activities um, in the area. And these principles are to ensure that we prevent the decrease in the size of harvest populations to levels below which ensure its recruitment, maintaining ecological relationships between harvested and dependent and related populations of Antarctic marine living resources, and preventing changes or minimizing the risk of changes in the marine environment, which cannot be reversed in two or three decades. Uh, also very important uh, part of this is that the organization operates by consensus, so we do need everyone to um, agree to adopting something like um, the Rossi MPA. Uh, we've got 25 um, members uh, that's a part of the Commission, one of which is the European Union. So the Ross Sea um, Region MPA, uh, it was adopted in the latter part of October 2016. It is um, codified in Conservation Measure 9105 and uh, 
some of you may know that the Ross Sea area is um, contains exceptional ecological value um, and, and is of scientific importance. Um, it's got a community of top-level predators, um, and it's very a, a very productive area uh, within the Southern Ocean. Uh, I'll also uh, just up front tell you that the uh, area is uh, among the best studied of uh, high latitude continental shelf oceans in the southern hemisphere and it's got a long time unique time series uh, describing the region's geological, climatic and ecological history. So it provides a, a great opportunity for um, scientific research, continued scientific research. The uh, MPA is about 1.55 million square kilometers, um, much of which of this is fully protected. Uh, this goes to, into effect on December 1, 2017, and um, has a period of designation of 35 years, so it is set to expire in 2052. However, if Camelar decides that um, it wants to continue uh, the existence of this MPA, it, w it can do so, um, but it will have to be by consensus. What you see on the left here with the figure are the, um, the boundaries of the MPA. We've got um, the general protection zone, which is uh, marked by Roman numerals 1, 2, and 3. And we've got the krill research zone over on the west side, and the special research zone, which covers a part of the continental slope. So this proposal started out uh, in October 2012. Um, during that meeting, New Zealand and the United States had come to the meeting with separate proposals because they were not able to uh, negotiate a singular proposal for Camelar's consideration. Uh, however, um, with the members, the Camelar membership insisting that uh, only one proposal be looked at uh, by the Commission, uh, we did work over the weekend to, to, to merge our proposals and what you see here on the left is um, what we came up with. Now there's been uh, some major revisions over time. In October 2013, the MPA was reduced by approximately 40%. Um, we ended up making some adjustments to our objectives to the proposal and this was based on advice from the, a special meeting of the scientific committee. In October 2000, jumping to October 2015, we have um, we had come to that meeting with with this uh, revised proposal. You'll see that the special research zone is expanded a little bit to the south uh, east, and the area over the um, the seamount area um, was uh, reduced um, in size as well. Uh, when we came to this meeting, the only countries or members that were objecting to the proposal was um, China and Russia. Uh, but during the two October 2015 meeting, uh, there were fairly intense negotiations with China, um, which resulted in the addition and expansion, actually, of the MPA to include the Krill Research Zone, which is right here. Um, which then left just Russia as the only one that um, was objecting to the uh, MPA. Um, during this last annual meeting uh, in October, uh, there were high-level discussions um, political uh, at the political levels, and um, that resulted in uh, Russia being able to come around to, um, to uh, agree to the proposal and thus uh, we got our MPA. Uh, and there's actually several articles out there um, about kind of um, how things went um, to get this adopted. But I won't speak to that so much. I thought uh, it might be good to hear about the details of the MPA itself. Uh, so some of the things that are captured um, within the MPA, uh, features and species that are uh, being protected now, uh, include trophically dominant pelagic prey species, um, the, which includes the um, Antarctic krill, uh, crystal krill, and Antarctic silverfish. We've got uh, large-scale ecosystem processes that are covered in here. Um, we've got uh, vulnerable marine ecosystems and 
uh, and this, it, all these colors represent dif different features or species. Um, so like these oval spots here are vulnerable marine ecosystems. This is a polar front. Um, and I can't, I know that's quite jumbled, so it's kind of hard to uh, distinguish all the different features, but uh, these colors do represent um, Adelie and em emperor penguin foraging areas. Uh, and key areas for Weddell seals and type C killer whales, uh, among other features. And in addition to having um, a conservation value, the MPA is designed to be a natural laboratory and a reference area for a scientific study of the impacts of climate change and fishing. Uh, so what um, the scientific objectives that are specified in the M MPA um, do state that uh, research and monitoring uh, be, be promoted um, and it's research and monitoring focused on marine living resources. We've got reference areas for monitoring natural variability and long-term change. As far as the uh, special research zone is concerned, uh, we do have some limited fishing that would take place in this zone and that's going to contribute to the toothfish tagging program. Uh, but because the fishing is somewhat limited, it's going to allow for comparison between this zone, the SRZ, and this zone out here, which is the fully developed fishing grounds. Uh, but otherwise, these two areas are um, ecologically comparable. And then we will also be promoting research uh, to increase our understanding of krill, and that will take place in the krill research zone, but krill fishing is also um, could take place uh, within the SRZ. So here's a little chart that shows some of the management measures for the various zones. So the GPZ, General Protection Zone, which encompasses about 72% of the MPA, fishing activities are prohibited except for research fishing. And this is um, designed to provide representative protection to, um, to uh, a, a various um, habitats and bioregions. It's also designed to mitigate or eliminate potential ecosystem threats from fishing and to support existing and future scientific research and monitoring. In the special research zone, encompassing 21% of the MPA, we are allowing um, toothfish harvest up to 15% of the to total annual catch limit of the Rossi stock. Uh, the catch limit lately has been uh, at, at about 3,000 metric tons. Um, now this area has sort of a different expiration date um, from the rest of the MPA. Uh, this, the management measures in this zone will expire at the end of 30 years. And after that time, uh, the catch limit of the Rossi stock will, should not exceed um, 20%. Um, and the krill research zone, which encompasses 7% of the MPA um, here, Antarctic krill would be harvested, could be harvested in accordance with a separate conservation measure that regulates exploratory fishing for krill. And as I mentioned, the krill can also be caught in the special research zone, but it would be subject to this, uh, this conservation measure for exploratory krill fish fishing. There are additional management measures that apply to all of the uh, MPA. Uh, transshipments are prohibited throughout. Uh, research and fishing vessels are to avoid dumping or discharging of waste or other matter into the MPA. And flag states uh, with vessels uh, entering the MPA must notify the Camelar Secretariat prior to the vessel's entry. The means by which we will be monitoring the MPA um, include the use of a centralized vessel monitoring system. Uh, Camelar, the Secretariat, um, has a VMS that um, all of the licensed vessels report to uh, with their location information. We also have means for uh, international boarding and inspection of fishing vessels as well as aerial and vessel patrol activities. Now, if any non-compliance with the MPA is detected uh, through these uh, monitoring means, then um, that non-compliance will be reported to the vessel's flag state, as well as referred to the Compliance Committee of Camelar. 
Inside uh, Conservation Measure 9105, we've got periodic review provisions for the MPA. And uh, this is uh, from a prior uh, working document, but um, we've got uh, CAMLAR members um, being required to submit every five years any activities that they undertake that are related to the MPA. That information is that then will be compiled and um, shared uh, through the CAMLAR Secretariat. And every 10 years, there will be a review of the MPA overall. This, during this review, the key question that uh, CAMLAR will try to answer is whether the MPA continues to meet the specific objectives um, that I had referred to earlier. Now, since the period of designation at this point is 35 years, we're looking at about um, three cycles of this 10-year um, uh, review. I included some um, this set of questions here uh, that um, that will need to be answered um, to to undertake that review, that ten year review. Uh, these questions will be um, a part of what gets answered through the uh, through the activities under the research and monitoring plan, uh, and. Uh, I think they make a very good sense in, in trying to uh, answer the question about whether an MPA achieves um, it, its objectives. So do the MPA boundaries continue to encompass the priority populations, features, and areas? What are the ecosystem roles of the identified habitats, processes, populations, life history stages, or other priority features? How are priority features potentially affected by fishing, climate change, environmental variability? And does the structure and function of the marine ecosystem differ between areas inside the MPA versus outside the MPA? Uh, and the same goes for populations or subpopulations of marine organisms. Uh, within the next year, we've got a couple of additional tasks related to the MPA. One is a research and development of a research and monitoring plan. A uh, workshop will take place uh, for this purpose uh, early uh, 2017. And then the other item that the scientific committee and its working groups will work, um, will be undertaking is the uh, opening of areas outside the MPA that are currently closed to fishing. And this will allow for the um, accommodating of fishing effort that's been displaced by the MPA. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and speak to uh, MPA efforts more generally. Uh, back in 2011, uh, CAMLAR adopted a general framework for establishing CAMLAR MPAs. And this uh, framework has been very helpful in guiding the development of proposals as well as guiding the discussions. Uh, and so, of course, it, it has more than what I've put on this, on this um, slide, but um, some key points are that MPAs are to be established based on best available science, that MPAs contribute to a range of protection and scientific objectives, that a research and monitoring plan for the MPA be adopted, and that the MPA be reviewed every 10 years. Now, this kind of, um, I, I think, is a bit, little bit repetitive what I've, with what I've spoken about the Ross Sea, because the Ross Sea MPA, of course, includes um, each one of these aspects. Uh, and when Kamler decided that it's going to, um, or I should say, Kamler decided uh, many years ago that it was going to set up a representative system of MPAs throughout its convention area. Uh, to help facilitate that, they um, set up these nine MPA planning domains. And the planning domain number eight is where the Ross Sea, we now have um, an a, a set of MPAs or an MPA for that region, but we also have um, efforts underway, a proposal in the East Antarctic region, as well as the Weddell Sea, and in this uh, planning domain number one, the Western Antarctic Peninsula, South Scotia Arc. So as I mentioned, we have, this, this kind of shows um, the various uh, MPA efforts that are in progress, and I have some um, additional slides to uh, show you the, um, the proposals that are out there. But um, the East um, Antarctica proposal, which is uh, uh, led by 
uh, Australia, France, and the European Union. Uh, this actually used at one point was seven uh, MPAs back in 2012 when um, they initially proposed it. Uh, and this propo this MPA proposal um, was kind of on the same track as, uh, or I should make, perhaps not the same track, but it was initially proposed just as the Ross Sea was back in 2012, and it's been um, tabled to each subsequent meeting of of the Camelar um, since then. But now it's down to uh, three areas. We also have this effort in the Weddell Sea. This effort is led by Germany. Um, and uh, we did see a version of this proposal during the last meeting, but um, due to a, a certain concerns that have been raised, uh, uh, we'll probably be seeing um, this, this proposal again at subsequent meetings. And then also, I don't have a slide for it, but so going back to this one, around the Antarctic Peninsula area, we do have Chile and Australia who are leading efforts to uh, create an MPA in this zone. Um, and then this green block here is the South Orkney Islands MPA that was adopted back in 2009 uh, prior to the uh, general framework that I had mentioned. And um, that that's, would be their oldest one. Okay, so that is my presentation, and um, I, here's my contact information if you want to reach out with um, additional questions, if people are interested in getting a copy of the conservation measure itself, um, I can make that available, um, or any other information that's requested. So thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so Mia, uh, a couple of comments that have, have come in, um, I guess one is just clarifying that these, these will not be effective until an another year from now, is that correct? That's correct, right. December 1, 2017 is when the MPA goes into force. Okay. And um, the, other, uh, the other comment uh, was that uh, apparently there's an old map that was uh, proposed for the Weddell Sea and there is an updated map available um, from Bob Zur is, is commenting on that. Okay, so, yes, I, I, I think the one I have on the screen that was from last year. So there's also a question um, asking about enforcement, and you mentioned the compliance uh, committee of Camelar, and there's a broader question about how is this uh, enforced uh, on the ground or on the water? Um, so as I mentioned, we, we've got, um, we have the ability to track licensed fishing vessels. Um, so, and, and the, the vessels that are licensed to operate in, in Camelar waters and perhaps in and around the MPA, uh, we have the ability to, to track their movements. Um, they do report uh, when they're um, entering actually different zones throughout the convention area. So I, I'd say that we have a pretty good handle on that. Uh, of course, when it comes to IUU vessels, um, that would be a different matter because they are trying to be fairly secret secretive about uh, where their locations and so on, but um, the vessels that operate in the area, they are required to report on vessels that they sight um, during, while they're in the convention area. We've got um, uh, countries like Australia and New Zealand who are able to undertake uh, vessel um, patrols, aerial patrols. I think the UK also, uh, during the last um, prior to the last meeting, had also undertaken a patrol um, in the convention area. So there are various means to try and monitor what's going on in the MPA. Uh, if if uh, non-compliance issues come up, um, there is within Camelar the Standing Committee on Implementation and Compliance, or, or we call it SCIC, uh, and we have through um, information from the Secretariat or through various members, we review information that comes in about the non-compliance um, and there is a discussion about those activities and uh, what sort of actions or further information might be necessary. So I'm not sure if that gets at completely at uh, the question that was raised, but um, no, I think it does, and I'm, I expect there'll be other questions about compliance because that is such a um, 
a difficult challenge for all MPAs. Yeah. Uh, and, and someone, Justin Pierce asks, uh, I know that archival tags are to be placed on toothfish in the SRZ. That would be the special research zone, I think. Um, will there be observers on vessels to ensure compliance? And who will be compiling and reviewing data when tags are returned? OK. Uh, so yes, there is already a tagging program in place um, that's uh, handled through the Secretariat. The um, tagging rate, um, th that's correct, the tagging rate that's required within the SRZ is higher than what we have for um, other areas. So what we have there um, is that toothfish that are caught uh, shall be tagged and released at a rate of at least three fish per ton, per metric ton green weight. Um, and tags shall include pop-up or implanted archival tags uh, that are deployed based on the advice from the scientific committee. Um, so that information is, is a regularly, or tag information, is regularly collected by the Secretariat and, and that information is fed into the stock assessment process even now. Okay, thanks. Um, so here's a question from Elizabeth Lacey asking, what are some of the implications of climate change to management practices? Impl implications of climate change. Um, so hopefully because of the way this MPA is designed and, and we will, I think, of course, see some sort of impacts um, due to climate change uh, in this area, and of course, other areas of um, of Antarctica. Uh, you know, if, if there is a need for, or if if there's habitats that are shifting um, due to climate change impacts, um, and the MPA, let's say, covers that area where the, cha the change in distribution may occur or if it doesn't I think that based on information that comes in and these periodic reviews that we undertake um, there will be opportunities for changing in boundaries um, to accommodate um, you know the the objectives uh, to make sure that we're we're adequately covering um, and adequately protecting areas that might be key foraging areas for say certain penguins or for um, for the mammal species. Uh, so I, I can think of that being kind of one, one way that we would be, um, that this MPA is accounting for uh, climate change impacts. The other thing that this um, MPA does, and it, it's, it's somewhat connected to what I, the example that I just gave, is that it provides an opportunity for there to be um, research on what those climate impacts change impacts are. Um, as I mentioned, there is a long um, time series of data that for this area. It's, it's very well studied, uh, relatively speaking, and thus um, that allows for the comparison of what's going on in the future with what has happened in the past to, to know kind of where, uh, how these bioregions are being affected by um, climate change. So you mentioned the research and monitoring, and uh, that's one of the next questions Nicole Bransom had asked. What do you think are the biggest challenges for developing and adopting a research and monitoring plan? Uh, there's actually a research, a draft research and monitoring plan that was um, developed a, a couple of years ago by uh, the scientific representatives um, to New Zealand and the United States. Um, and uh, when when the workshop happens early next year, I think it's going to use that draft uh, research and monitoring plan as, as the basis for the discussions, and uh, it'll it'll be get modified according to the uh, new information or newer information, and um, based on of course the the final MPA. Um, Perhaps with the planning itself, I don't know how much uh, in the way of challenges it'll present. Um, I do see that uh, it's important now that CAMLAR members or others go out there and actually conduct the research. Um, and this being a somewhat remote location, or a, it is a remote location, um, and I, I think there there is interest in folks going out there and conducting research, but I think with the research and monitoring plan in place, I, um, the hope is people will use that plan to guide some of the research activities that they would undertake um, and that uh, people actually do carry out and participate in, in the research activities. 
So another question related to the research and monitoring plan is from Bob Zur, and he asks, given Russia and China's opposition to the Rossi MPA early on, and in particular Russia's focus on science, is there an opportunity to engage both countries in the development and implementation of the research and monitoring plan to help cement a more positive approach to the MPA? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, I, I, that, and that's a very good thought. Um, the research and monitoring plan workshop that's going to happen uh, early next year, it's open to all of the CAMELAR members. Um, and, and I would hope that we would see the scientific representatives at least from um, each of the CAMELAR membership. Um, uh, Russia has done some work, I understand, uh, in the Ross Sea. Um, and China is a somewhat newer member to CAMELAR um, and has done uh, quite a bit with uh, in relation to krill, I think their interest is uh, more in, in the krill area. Uh, so I anticipate that um, that there would be opportunities for them to collaborate uh, on research activities that go on uh, within the Rossi region. Um, there is research, of course, already underway in the Rossi region, and some of that is carried out by, um, or at least proposed uh, by Russia, along with several of the other Kamlar members. And Nicole Bransom also asks, does the U.S. have a research cruise planned or a budget available to do a baseline monitoring plan? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I don't know that I can answer that question. Uh, my colleagues from uh, National Science Foundation and our uh, Southwest Fisheries Science Center would probably be better positioned to answer that. I don't know. Maybe I can get back. To, yeah, you'll, um, you'll, you'll have contact information, and if anyone from those agencies is on and wants to contribute some comments, that would be great. But otherwise, we can take that one offline. Uh, so the uh, actually, there's a couple of questions about this 35-year uh, expiration. The IUCN stipulates that MPA should be permanent, and the Ross C MPA is 35 years, and so. Um, is there a precedent here in terms of uh, high seas MPAs or other MPAs or future MPAs in the Antarctic? Yeah, so um, I, I started my presentation by saying that uh, CAMELAR operates uh, by consensus. So we had to have um, every single member say okay uh, for adopting this MPA. Um, and we knew uh, along as, as the negotiations progressed that the, that some countries were going to insist that there be an expiration date um, on this MPA. Now, we also had members who insisted that there not be an expiration date, but uh, to find that common ground, um, we did end up having to come to some number of years uh, with, a, with a hard stop. Um, uh, as far as a precedent, as to whether it sets a precedent um, for other areas, um, I'm not clear on that. I, um, I, my personal view is that MPAs ought to be uh, designated in, in perpetuity um, and I, I, as we've seen with um, MPAs in the United States, I mean, we don't have uh, an expir date, expiration date um, on these things. So uh, this being now kind of the first large-scale high seas MPA and it's got an, uh, an expiration date, um, I mean some countries were interested in making sure that there was sort of, uh, or treating this as, to some extent as an experiment, that we don't quite know if this is going to accomplish what it what we are setting out to accomplish through this MPA. Um, and so a hard stop kind of allows uh, those countries to have some comfort in that um, this would expire, uh, you know, if, if it doesn't become an, a successful sort of experiment. Um, so I, as far, because that's the reasoning behind it. I'm not sure if things are established elsewhere in other in other parts of the world and on the high seas. Um, I'm not quite sure how this decision is going to then impact the sort of duration of um, other high seas MPAs. So it's a very hard topic, question to answer. It is, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of interest in that in that question because I know it was um, it was a tough negotiation around that point. And so just a couple of additional questions that if you can shed any additional light on, I think one is why 35 years? And the other is um, 
when you get to 35 years, was there a discussion about um, the MPA staying in place unless it was voted to be, to be ended or ended as, uh, unless it was voted to be turned off? In other words, the, de the f default ended up being that it would end unless the voters, unless the members vote to renew it, but it could have easily been the reverse, and I wonder if that was considered. Okay. Um, when New Zealand and the U.S. first proposed uh, this MPA, it had a provision in there with what we were calling a soft stop, um, that we would be taking a look at this at the end of 50 years, but it, was, it didn't expire the MPA. Uh, so that that was what we started off with, and where we arrived is with the hard stop. Um, and um, and so when we have uh, when we were talking about the the number itself, um, a, a variety of numbers were suggested to the proponents by other members, and what we were hearing at one point like ten years for the period of designation, 20 years, 30 years, um, 40 years. So it was kind of a, a range of views that were out there. Um, and in the end, um, I, it, it appeared that we might have, um, well, well, we, what we seemed to be certain about was that 50 years, uh, which is sort of a starting point that we had in mind, um, was not acceptable to these particular members who wanted a hard stop uh, or an expiration. And um, so there were negotiations and these were sort of um, among the heads of delegation. Uh, it's, it was, it was um, through that discussion that happened among the heads of delegation that they arrived at the, at the 35 years. Um, and it, it had to do with kind of balancing, I guess, suggestions by certain members about the hard stop, about wanting 30 years and others wanting more. Um, so we ended up with a, with a compromise of 35 years. Okay. Um, could you explain more about the areas that have been newly open to fishing and where they are and what the potential conservation impacts of this measure might be? Sure. Okay, so what I think I'll do then, um, I don't have a slide that shows it, but I can kind of point it out. Maybe this is the, the best one to look at. Uh, we've got different um, divisions uh, within the Ross Sea, and at the moment we've got this kind of this swath, if you can see my arrows going up. So this, this spot is, at the moment, close to fishing. Oops, I didn't need to do that. And then this spot along here is uh, at close to fishing. We've got some closures also kind of in in this area that I um, I would have a hard time identify exactly where. So these areas are going to be the ones that will be outside the MPA that will become open for fishing. Um, these areas have been closed uh, in the past for a variety of reasons. Um, for example, they wanted to concentrate fishing so that they could get more information from particular zones. Um, in other parts of the convention area, areas have been closed because certain populations have uh, not recovered, um, and this is not toothfish, um, but other species. Uh, so. Things like that have happened in the past, but what is going to happen with this MPA is that we're now within this zone. We're, we're taking kind of a holistic perspective versus the sort of piecemeal closures that have happened in the past. Um, the, the, since the Ross Sea toothfish stock is all considered one stock here, it, it's now taking what might have been caught um, down in in these zones and uh, redistributing it to these areas outside. Um, so, and in, and in opening sort of these closed areas, uh, we are still going to be abiding by those conservation principles that, that I mentioned, um, that whatever catch level is set 
is not going to result in the depletion of these harvested species or certain impacts to um, dependent and related species. So those safeguards will, will continue to be in place. Okay, thanks. And you mentioned in your presentation uh, research fishing that would be allowed in uh, some of the MPA zones. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and, and what, is, what is entailed in research fishing and how, um, how extensive that might be. Um, so research fishing is something that uh, tends to be, well, at this time, uh, it's proposed by various members. Um, when we come up with a research and monitoring plan, I think that's going to guide what kind of research fishing uh, should be occurring within the MPA. Uh, CAMELAR has a conservation measure, um, it's 2401, that uh, regulates what the the process for allowing research fishing. And so if there are certain amounts of catch uh, that would be caught in the course of the research fishing, um, it triggers a certain process by which then the scientific committee would be taking a look at what is being proposed and then that advice would be provided to the, the commission uh, for discussion. Um, but, so I, but I think in answer to your question, it's going to be largely driven um, in the future by um, uh, the research and monitoring plan and that um, but I, I will add that a lot of this research fishing that does go on currently in the Rossi region does involve um, uh, taking of toothfish. Okay and can they be sold when they're taken or they uh, yes yes they can yeah um, so I would just invite any of the participants, if you have any other questions, I, I will go ahead and ask another question of Mia, but if anyone has any other questions, please go ahead and, and send them in, or comments. Um, so Mia, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned the var variety of proposals that have been uh, made or in progress regarding MPAs, and I was interested in hearing your comments on what you think is most likely to be on the horizon next in terms of MPAs in the region. Uh, so um, the East Antarctic uh, proposal has been um, considered uh, several times now by Camelar and uh, it's unclear um, when, if and when, uh, that proposal would get adopted. Um, the Weddell Sea, uh, now that has just gotten started in a sense, um, although the, the compiling of scientific information to support that MPA has has been in the works for a few years. Um, I, one of the areas that I'd say is sort of a priority um, for the United States, um, well MPAs are I think generally, generally a, a priority, but the um, domain one or the area, um, the Antarctic Peninsula area where the United States has invested a lot of research um, I, in, the, in this zone. Uh, we're waiting to see what's going to come up um, as far as the the various zones, the management measures, um, the objectives uh, that will be developed um, for Domain One. Um, I, as far as like what has a better chance for um, being adopted next, that's um, that's really unclear. <laughs> I mean, even the Ross Sea, which I think is built on very solid ground, the the proposal itself was written very clearly um, and it had a lot of support even then it, it had it had taken a lot of time and a lot of intense effort and negotiations uh, at the political levels um, to have that adopted um, so I, I, I can't really speculate on um, where and when other MPAs would get adopted within the uh, convention area okay uh, we do have another question about the Ross Sea, and the question is, uh, is the decision on the Ross Sea seen as a strengthening of Camelar and its commitment to conservation, given that it came four years after the self-imposed target of 2012? Right, yes. <laughs> we did have, Camelar did have a self-imposed target of 2012 to have a rep representative uh, network of MPAs. Um, within the convention area, but I do think that we consider it a, uh, a milestone, a, it's, um, 
I think uh, with adoption of this MBA, it's kind of putting Camelar back in the forefront of um, being pro progressive um, as, as far as um, this, uh, as, as an organization that has um, some management responsibility over fisheries. Um, so, yes, yeah. And uh, getting back to the, to the question about fisheries, um, there's also a question or a comment. Uh, some of the toothfish and krill fisheries are certified by MSC. Um, has sustainability certification played any role in conservation decisions that you are aware of? Um, the Camelar decisions, uh, not so much. Um, we are, within Camelar, there are several working groups that look at, say, um, or a working group on ecosystem monitoring and management, or we've got a working group working on looking at acoustic and other um, methodologies. Um, and so we have a, a process built in by which Camelar uses that to make its decisions. And I don't know that the MSC certifications have come into play uh, during those processes. Um, so, yeah, as far as I'm aware, um, I, I don't think it has much, um, has had uh, an, an influence perhaps um, on these decisions, but uh, someone, perhaps on, uh, others on my delegation might, might correct me on that. Okay. Uh, and here's an interesting climate-related question. Um, considering the conservation measure for the Ross Sea gives the southernmost boundary of the Ross Sea MPA, including the area under the Ross Sea ice shelf, does that mean that as the ice shelf melts, those areas would automatically come under the protection of the MPA and be part of the general protection zone? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I, um, I assume that it's not, but I'm, I don't know. I'm look, I want to look at the boundary map again. Um, Can you point no, to I where think it is a, being Yeah, heard? so I think this is the ice shelf that the question is referring to. Um, no, I think it does encapsulate it. But I, I don't know if we didn't draw a line down here. <laughs> so I assume that it's going to the coast if, if this okay. were to melt. Yeah, it would be interesting, I think, from a communications perspective to maybe draw in the rest of the boundaries of the MPA, like, you know, along the shoreline or wherever they end because it, it yes. is a little bit ambiguous. Well, uh, but what we do have, um, that, that question I guess caught me off guard a bit, um, but we do have a um, description, and I, and I think a description of boundaries for an MPA are critical uh, so that you know exactly the areas that you're talking about. So in our description, it, it does include, it's an area bounded by a line starting at you know 160 degrees east from the coastline, um, and and so I think it looks like it does. Uh, it, I, I, it would encapsulate that the the um, the area under the ice shelf. Yes, and I'm seeing a couple of comments that have come in saying yes that the boundary does go to the coast, and that last they heard um, that the MPA would continue to expand up to the ice shelf as the shelf melts. Yes, yeah. Um, and and Thank also you for that question. <laughs> a couple of people commenting that if you include the ice shelf, it's actually the area of the Ross Sea MPA is closer to 2 million uh, kilometers squared rather than, you know, 1.55. Yeah, that's, um, that's a good point. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for people who are chiming in on this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's an interesting point, I think, in terms of just communicating the size and, and uh, you know, the, these may seem like uh, small points, but as we all know, as you said, Mia, that the boundary issues can be extremely important. Yeah, oh, but let me just add that um, another item that Camelar adopted at this last meeting is uh, around the Antarctic Peninsula, um, if ice shelves collapse, uh, we now have a process by which we're setting up um, areas special areas for scientific study. And those areas uh, remain with particular designations for a 10-year period, uh, whereby it, it, um, fishing uh, would, would, not be pro would be prohibited so that the, the scientific um, investigations can be undertaken. Oh, that's interesting. So that's sort of an automatic uh, measure that goes into place if that occurs. Um, 
Somewhat, yes. All right, I wanted to pass on one other comment. This is from Todd Jacobs in the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries who is involved. He is the project manager at NOAA's um, Unmanned Aircraft Systems and has been working on testing some of these systems in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands in the Arctic and this year in Antarctica. And so he just comments that uh, he would be happy to, uh, to talk offline with you further about this. They did spend six weeks in the Ross Sea. Oh, excellent, okay. So are there any other questions from the audience? And in the meantime, I will just say that uh, I want to thank you very much, Mia, for joining us. And, uh, and there were a couple of comments about the terrific pictures that you were able to use. Um, really brings home how important and uh, rich and vibrant this area is. Yes. Well, thank you, Lauren, and uh, to others who uh, joined the uh, discussion. Um, I appreciate the questions. and. Uh, the opportunity to uh, speak to this issue. All right. Thanks, everyone. And uh, thanks, Mia. All right. We'll okay. talk to you soon. Okay. Talk to you soon.